Welcome back to Red Cloud Summer Uranium Conference. I'm David Talbot, Managing Director and Head of Research for Red Cloud Securities. And we finally made it to the final session of the day. I thank you all viewers for uh, sticking with us today. If you have missed parts of our conference, you can. Uh, we will have replays available on the Red Cloud Financial Services website. That's redcloudfs.com. Now, during our fireside chat today, I hope to get some buy-side investor perspective of the uranium and nuclear industry. And I invite in, uh, uh, viewers to ask any questions they might have using the Q&A button on the screen. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can. But before we get kick things off, I wanna make some introductions. Uh, from Satcham Cove Partners, we have Michael Alkin. He is the uh, principal of the company and general partner of the Satcham Cove Special Opportunities Fund. He's also CIO of the public, public equities of Lloyd Harbor Capital Management and is investor investment manager of the fund. He has uh, nearly 25 years of hedge fund experience and has a contrarian and deep value interest investing approach. He was previously an analyst and has worked at uh, several other partners as well. So uh, anyways, Michael, welcome back this year. Thanks, David. Good to see you. From Tribeca Investment Partners, we have Guy Keller. He's Portfolio Management Manager of Nuclear Energy Opportunities. Now, Guy has 20 years of global commodity trading experience, including 15 as a director of Macquarie, most recently as head of the Asia-based metals trading desk in Singapore. And he's run trading strategies across base metals, precious metals, and iron ore. He began his uh, career with Hothschild's bullion division and then moved to Credit Suisse First Boston in the London bullion markets as a precious metals trader. So welcome to the show, Guy. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. And uh, we have from L2 Capital founding partner, Marcello Lopez. This Brazilian-based asset management company operates a specialist uranium investment fund that's ma managed by Marcello. He has 20 years, over 20 years experience in the financial markets in London, Sydney, and Sao Paulo. He has a mechanical engineering degree and international MBA with a specialization in finance. So welcome to the show as well. Thanks, David. Pleasure to talk to you again. So guys, the theme to our conference last year, you know, was that this time uranium investing is different. And and this year, I think it's more of the same. You know, if 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 I go back to some of the takeaways from last year, you know, essentially ESG investors were taking notice. Uranium was finally getting recognition as a green energy source. Uh, a lack of support was coming from the U.S. for both nuclear and uh, and uranium. Sorry, a lot of support was coming from the U.S. finally uh, for both nuclear and uranium. Uh, demand for physical uranium had increased considerably, and both investors, including the emergence of, of Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, for the first time that I can recall in about 15 years, covering the sector by the uranium companies, you know, which which is uh, unusual. So um, last year prices rose 30 bucks to 40 bucks a pound. So summing up, I think 2021 was really about physical physical uranium investment, and 2022 I think that's still around and a key issue. But we've got this additional layer of of geopolitical risk, which I don't think we had prior. You know, namely the unrest in Kazakhstan early in the year, and then the the invasion um, of Ukraine by Russia. So I, I would say that prices are probably more volatile this year. Um, you know, they've gone from 40 to four to to 63, back down, you know, to 47 or so. So I guess maybe let's let's start here with the actual spot market and maybe even focus on the physical demand. You know, I think the spot market, it's pretty volatile. Um, there's a narrow demand margin, uh, but, you know, we, we're seeing physical buying that we hadn't seen before. And I think tra traders are trying to front end that uh, that buying as well. So, and, and a lot of this is discretionary. It's beyond market fundamentals. So um, who, who wants to kick things off, start talking about what they're seeing in the spot market with respect to physical demand? Uh, hi, Dave. Um, I, I think focusing on the spot market is focusing on the long market. At, at times, it makes sense because when you know historically, 80 to 85 percent of what transpires in the in the nuclear fuel market is in long-term contracts. Occasionally, 
there will be situations where mis there's a mismatch of supply and demand, and you will see more supply like you saw post Fukushima when Jap Japan took off their reactors and it was a backup in the system and there was surplus disposal and you had a tremendous amount of oversupply in, this, in the market and it needed a place to go and that was spot. And because of a very great environment back then and excess pounds, you saw the advent uh, of the investment banks coming in in 2012, 2013 and introducing the carry trade, which worked as a wonderful clearing mechanism for excess supply in the spot market. And the utilities played it beautifully by not re-engaging in long-term contracts. They stayed out of the market and they wound up going in and contracting for one in two years because Goldman, Deutsche, they could do it because rates were very low and there was an abundance of supply in the spot market. Traders are not in the long-term contract conversation because they can't guarantee supply, but they could derive an additional stream of revenue from the carry trade. They did it well, utilities did it well. That That's long in the tooth, a couple of reasons. One is mobile pounds in the spot market are much uh, uh, less than they were. It's, it's difficult to go find a ton of pounds. People, Price has gone from 17 at the bottom to, to 47, 48. It's been as high as 60. It bounces around, but it's moving. It keeps moving higher. But the reality is uh, it's very hard for a carry trade to be executed right now because A, rates are going up, and B, the availability and spot sitting there picking off pounds doesn't make it easier for you. So now you're, you're testing. You have to remember that going back since 2012, the long-term contracting as a percentage of annual consumption is under 40 percent. We, as an analog, we saw the same thing from the mid 90s to early 05, when a contracting cycle. Back then, a third of of consumption was recontracted in a given year, and then in 05, it went to 150 percent and stayed at those levels for the next eight years or so. What we're seeing now is you've had well south of 40 percent for uh, 10 years, and the spot market is quite thin, and now you have a long-term contract market that prior to Kazakh unrest, prior to Russia invading Ukraine, was becoming less relevant as utilities were finally starting to test the uh, productive capacity, that's uh, the economic productive capacity. So, you know, the, the market likes to look at what it's presented with every day. The long-term contract is not one of them. But the other thing they do look at is the spot market. But, but to understand the spot market is to understand how it's how it's formed every single day there could be a price that's posted and there was not a trade right those who are really familiar with the with the uh nuclear fuel cycle will know that sometimes mid-month oftentimes end of month there are offtake agreements traders will walk those pounds down on the bid and the ask side it's just the nature of the beast but we are in a period now where there is no analog post february 24th we're, we're in uncharted territory so for those who want to stare at the spot price, those who think that the spot price is an indication of the health of the market, the supply of the market, they're looking at the wrong market. Because what we have seen post uh, uh, February 24th, we see, we see uh, contract prices in the low to mid 50s. We see terms within contracts becoming more flexible, becoming more of a seller's market. And that those, 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 those long-term prices are up from the, from the low 40s and they're not budging. Right, so the spot market is something that we think is becoming more and more and totally irrelevant because you're not going to be able to support long-term production in, in contracts and energy security, which is really the big thing right now. Uh, sorry to be so long-winded on that. Uh, if, if I may, if I may just add something, uh, David, uh, and I think the, the what happened to the spot market is that SPUT entered the market and gave it more, um, you know, clarity so people could see what was happening in the market more uh, clearly. Uh, but the bull market in uranium will happen once utilities start signing contracts, once a new uh, contract cycle starts, uh, then we're going to see really where uranium prices are. Um, and I think we are in the beginning of this uh, contract signing now. Uh, you see Cameco signed lots of contracts, uh, over 70 million pounds, uh, they announced. Uh, Encore is signing contracts as well. CGN announced last week uh, that it signed a contract as well. 
uh, with with a, a, a floor of above sixty dollars for the for the fixed part, uh, and and uh, and even Global Atomic as well announced the intention. So. Uh, we are starting to see utilities uh, look for the pounds. Obviously, they have bigger problems now. They have to, to, to procure enrichment and conversion, which is way more important for them because how good is it to, to have uranium and not have conversion on enrichment? So they are focusing on what's urgent now, but uh, uranium contract is, is on the way. Mm -hmm. Let, and you are, seeing, I mean, are. you are seeing it, prices are moving higher and, and, and the, it, the interest is being driven by market fundamentals. That's what's driving it. That's what's bringing fuel, buyer, fuel buyers out and to the negotiating table. They, ha they, they have no choice. Now, as Marcelo said, they swim upstream. Enrichment capacity is 40% driven by the Russians, right, versus uranium in the teens. So they need to go make sure that as they transition and self-sanction away, they can get that. And, th and then conversion is next, where the Russians own 30%. So it's a very complicated dance that they're doing but the market interest is driving that them towards contracting and you're seeing it happen. So, so would you say that the term price is, is becoming a, a little bit more uh, in focus, if you will, it's, it's becoming a more accurate gauge as to what the market is or should be as opposed to the spot market. Cause you know, you, you mentioned there was, you know, volatility mid month or end of month when the traders get, uh, you know, get involved. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there's any uh, hanky panky going on, but you know, when Sprott gets Why? involved- Why wouldn't you say that? <laughs> well, okay, there maybe, but my, my point is Sprott. Sprott's, Sprott's a lot more active in the spot market than any other physical trader has been or buyer has been in the past. Mm -hmm. And what we tend to see when Sprott enters the market, you know, they bought 40 million pounds since inception not too long ago, is prices tend to rise. And that's just a fundamental of, you know, they're buying a lot of product in, in the spot market, right? And so when they stop buying, it actually settles back. Is this sort of going to be the new normal? We're, we're going to have to worry about volatility be, because of who's buying? Well, that's if the, if the fuel buyers were focusing on spot market as their guide, they're focusing on security of supply of production economics now. They were getting there and actually slower than we thought they should have prior to January. We, 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 they were getting there. The, the prices were moving higher. We're very pleased with that, but we were thinking, you guys don't see the freight train that's coming. You're going to see it and that's fine. But but the catalyst was, and who knows the catalyst, you don't know that geopolitical risk is gonna drive it. But that's what happens when you've overstayed your welcome at the, at the trough of excess supply. And, and you know, bulls and bears make money, pigs get slaughtered, right? And when you've overstayed your welcome, shit happens. And so now what we're experiencing is, is, is spot price can move around, but that's not changing where long-term contracts are being done because they're going in, let, let's wipe out the 115 million-ish pounds of low cost nonsense pounds, first tier pounds that if they don't want profit, maybe it's 120 million, 115. Now add in the next start profit seeking pounds Right on demand that we'll talk about where demand is. Demand isn't 200. Demand in, in, in is, is materially higher than that. And secondary supply is in the 20, 25 million pound ballpark and shrinking rapidly. You have a massive gap that needs to be filled and that's only gonna come from much higher prices. And that's why spot will have less of an impact on contract pricing in our view. Yeah, and ju ju just an addendum here, Mike, if I will, uh, uh, most of the underfeeding and secondary supply comes from Russia as well which uh, it's, it's being sanctioned. So uh, you're gonna see that disappear as well. Okay, okay. Um, do you guys- Hey Guy, you're being so patient, sorry. <laughs> yeah, feel free to jump in anytime. So um, it, it, does anybody on the panel have a view on what we, we see as real demand in the spot market rather than financial demand? Um, Dave, I'm going to jump in here because again, I'm saying spot market doesn't matter, right? So we can we can sit here for the next hour and talk about spot. That that's going to be that's not where the market is. The market is RFPs are coming out from utilities. They are starting to sit there and start to do uh, contracting with bilateral discussions, which is how it will really get done. So the spot market again 
If you're in 2015, 16, and 17, if the enrichers are underfeeding, if they're dumping it into the market and there's a lot out there, prices go from, from uh, you know, your post Fukushima 65 down to 17. We're now at almost $50. Spot market is yesterday. That's excess supply, that's, that's gone. So what you really want to do is, in our view, that's how we care. We suggest anyone who's staring at the spot market, either do one of two things, sell your stock, if you don't like the day-to-day -day movements or go short the sector, because we'll take the other side of that bet. The market has moved to long-term contracting. If the market doesn't appreciate that, that's fine. Time will tell, it will sort itself out. But to spend all of the time having people focused on the spot market is an exercise in futility in our view. Yeah, we're, we're going back to my early days and following the sector 2007, 8% of the market was spot but I bet you 100% of the investor focus was on that spot market. It's because it's the only thing they show. Does the average investor know that the spot market price on any given day could be a trade or could be really a bullshit bid and ask because somebody wants to move the price down? Do they know that? Probably not. But yet they'll sell and buy their stocks on that, right? So really what they should understand for all the time people spend trying to figure out where spot price is going, here's a suggestion. Take the time model out how much conversion capacity exists in the world, how much swoop capacity exists in the world, how much of that is east versus west, and then how much of that is going to need to be overfed because there's not enough capacity. And that, that's the math we should be doing. I mean, we might not, people might not be interested, and I get that, I totally get it. Doesn't mean I'm right at all, I could be dead wrong, but that's the path we're going down. We just don't think spot's relevant. It's, 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 it's not where the market is headed. Right. It, 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 ultimately, I've been saying for years that we need to get back to contracting. And uh, and yet we keep focusing on spot and spots the other thing that we see every day. So um, you mentioned East versus West or, you know, do you believe we will get a bifurcated uranium market here? Maybe one with a price for Russian, Kazakh, Uzbek material uh, and then a premium for the rest of the world's production. You think we're heading in that direction? I think I think you have to just. I mean, yes, you look you look at look at oil markets right now. You know, you've got Russian oil uh, sold into China and India at a big discount. Um, you know, and and other materials coming out of Russia is is, is already paving that way. Uh, and that's you know without those products necessarily being officially sanctioned. Uh, and that's what we're hearing from the uranium sector. The nuclear sector is short term. They've got a problem. Uh, that longer term they have to solve uh, in trying to uh, make the investment to to uh, to real build or restart Western capacity. But but you're already hearing utilities saying that they are trying to uh, look elsewhere. They will uh, you know honour their existing contracts naturally because they have to, uh, but potentially look elsewhere for uh, for future capacity. So yeah, I mean the the, the energy market's already showing us that this is happening. So. I see no reason why the uh, the nuclear market's not going to go the same way. Dave, you know you know how it works with enrichment, right? It, it's a double-edged sword. So at times, when you have excess capacity, uh, all enrichment is is force and and material, right? It's force in the work of, in the form of a separate work unit, and and you can't shut the cascades down once they're started. So once you have too much, you can wind up using uh, uh, more force and less material. And, and you can fill orders, use up capacity, which is what your goal, that underfeed. Now, now you're in a situation where, you know, Russia has 40% of the global enrichment market, right? A lot of that is done for themselves, but over 20% is done for the outside world. And so that's, mm -hmm. as Guy was saying, that's, that's being self-sanctioned away. They want, the Western world wants to get away from it as fast as they can. The challenge that, that's in that market is, is because prices were down in enrichment for many years, just like uranium, um, they did not replace retiring uh, capacity. So as this capacity is short, now luckily in enrichment, the ability to extract uh, the same amount of end orders that are needed out of less capacity can occur by using more natural uranium in UF6. It's called overfeeding, right? And so you can overfeed the reactors to the tune of maybe 10 million separative work units. In, in, in plain math, you're looking at 25 million pounds per year. You know how many people's math that is in? Mm -hmm. Nada. 
Right, right. Do, and do and by mean, the way, you want to know the real delta that occurs? The delta that occurs then is what is in people's math is underfeeding from Russia that would come into the market. See ya. Uh, Western enricher underfeeding, yeah, right? Six, seven million pounds, uh -uh, gone. Right. So those those deltas right there could, could swing upwards of, of 30 to 40 million pounds. Those are big numbers that is that are yet. The other thing you'll see in models when you look at them that have not adapted to where we are in the fuel cycle and what's going on is you'll see inventory drawdowns that that some forecasters use nothing as nothing more than a plug number. And in, in a period where enrichers will be short uranium and have to go buy it to be able to overfeed and you see others with the wor changing world nuclear order, um, your drawdowns are not going, they're very unlikely to occur because inventory levels are at, at, at very at, uh, 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 normal levels anyway. So drawdowns, the industry has a way of using plug numbers uh, to, to get to where they want to look balanced. But but the reality is you're looking at at tens of millions of pounds of deficits for, for you know for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, ju just complementing the, the answer here, uh, uh, Arano, Converdine have also said that they, they have the ability to increase production, but they need a, a response from the market now because uh, they need to sign long-term contracts. They say they're not going to produce into the spot market because as Michael pointed out, it's, it's not a market that gives them reliability to, to increase production. So they need the, the prices to, to stay where they are because now they, there's incentives. Uh, a couple of years ago, enrichment was below $50. Uh, today is above 130. So now they have the, the incentive to go out and build more capacity, but they need to sign long-term contracts. They, uh, Converdine, Orano, they all said that. So uh, it, it, it goes back to, to the long-term contract in, in the whole cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, and Dave, for, for those who are trying to learn the industry, right, the fuel cycle, without understanding each component and the capacity within each component of a fuel cycle, makes it very hard. And it's, it's complicated, but, right, it's yellow cake, which is uranium. It gets converted to UF6, it gets enriched, it gets fabricated. Each stage is really important because fuel buyers are contracting along each stage. And enrichment and conversion, those are services. You can't, you can't have a service without, without the product, was uranium. But because the capacity was so heavily skewed in conversion and enrichment towards the east, you, you're, you see that the panic will go. SWOO is up 100% in a month, right? So they swim upstream fuel buyers. They will go to, they will go to enrich, con, enrichment and conversion, and then where there's a little bit more, and also remember, if you're a fuel buyer, you have a lot of carnival barking junior miners running around saying, we can produce it 50, we can produce it, they're full of shit. They can't do that. A, they, 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 they can't, they need much higher prices, but they're in the business of going out and raising money. But so the, the real reality is in those who could, they're tiny. You're talking by our math, 35 plus million pounds structural deficits for as far as the eye can see. And that that doesn't that's not picked up in, in short term spot trading back and forth with traders whipping it around trying to get better pricing for for a 500,000 pound offtake we're talking energy security that has been uh, ignored for the better part of 20 years you asked about a bifurcated market up until 2003 there were two prices the CIS price and the western price right CIS being Soviet state price that we we believe you will go back and see that and that's where the math gets really funky because if you look where uranium is consumed versus where it's produced, the mismatch, the mismatch is staggering. 70, 65, 70% of demand comes from the West. Uh, you know, l l less than 40% of the supply comes from, from the West. So you, you need to start to get those back. And as Mark Lucello said, you need to incentivize these enrichers and converters and the miners with contracts. They're not gonna do it on a spot basis. They won't make the investment. So you essentially agree that Rosatom is going to continue to underfeed here. They're not going to shut down their centrifuges. Those pounds are going to China. Oh, Dave, 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 forget, for, Rosatom, forget, forget underfeeding with Rosatom. It's not going to make its way to the West. So it, right. it doesn't matter, right? right? They, they could underfeed, but but here's the here's the real rub. Everyone thinks Russia a, 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 has a plethora of uranium. 
They're going to have to go out into the market and look for it and get, have to underfeed just because to feed their own reactors and to feed their export reactors. But Russia underfeeding is not a story. It's, it's nobody's story. That's just not, it's not part of it. Right. Just, it, it, just, just to go back to, to Guy's point, uh, he mentioned the, the oil markets in Russia and the bifurcation. Uh, it's actually quite funny because everyone is making money. The, the US is exporting gas to, to, to Europe. Now, uh, Russia is selling uh, oil to, to India at, at a huge discount and India is reselling the oil to Europe. So uh, Europe is, 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 is paying the bill, but uranium does not work like that. Uranium, you, 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 you know where it comes from. And I don't think utilities that there are, especially the, the ESG compliant ones, are not going to, to touch that material. And, and just a couple of years ago, we were all discussing the Russian suspension agreement. And uh, the, the agreement has to be flexed a little bit in the years uh, around 2025, 26, because there was not enough supply in the West. So the, 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 I, I think the run we're going to see in uranium is going to be epic. OK, no, thank you for that, guys. So um, question came in here. How have you guys been managing your own uranium stock portfolios during this uh, latest global market meltdown? And what sort of advice can you give investors who are essentially shocked by the sell off? So, uh, Well, we, uh, we don't give advice. Um, you know, I, we're not in the advice business. I'm, I'm happy to share our view on the market. Caveat it, we could be wrong, right? We, we'd like to think we've been a fairly right the last few years, um, but but we certainly do not give advice. But, you know, it's it, it depends, right? Where it's, the, the there is no analog in the uranium market for where we are today. There simply isn't, right? We are in uncharted territories where the risk to the price is on the upside. That's it. The risk to the downside would, would is, is, of course, we're looking every day for it and trying to understand where we're wrong. Could a reactor melt down? You'd like to think not, but stuff happens, right? But we don't think that's part of the story, but there's no analog. So when you look at where, where oil is post February 24th, uh, we're, and then now where the equities, the oil equities are getting pounded. Like the, like the uh, the question said, it, it's a market meltdown, and and this isn't immune from it. And so, you know, you just w w the other thing I, I learned over the evolution of the fund is the outside noise was staggering. It is staggering. Uh, the sentiment changes on a dime. Uh, I, Guy and I joke once in a while sometimes, uh, or Marcelo, we sit there and say you, you chat with each other occasionally and say, wow. Sentiment change. You don't even and 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 on and, and and people are going down rabbit holes. And right, it's simple. It's it's complicated to learn, but once you do, the math is relatively simple. It's subtracting, division, multiplication, and so on. But as we watch it, I personally have learned. Yeah, I, I keep a little cash around because you know uh, uh, John six seven two four seventeen in his mom's basement might have said something, and he has six followers, and now that causes. Uh, the whole world to change upside down, right? And and so you've learned, we've learned personally just to keep some extra cash around for those days. And and um, you know, you you we we had a reasonable amount of cash, not a not a ton of cash. So you know, there we 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 go up and down like the markets. Sometimes we like to think we're better than the markets. We try, um, but uh, we're we're just focused on the fundamentals. The drawdown for us, the drawdowns from the markets that are moving. Um, if you're, again, it doesn't mean we're right, but if we're right, we just take this as an opportunity to uh, increase what we're doing. Because uh, our conviction level, our conviction level, I know they're not on the call right now, but our, our friends, uh, Art and Adam over at Segura Capital, I, I, I don't think they would be upset me saying their conviction level today is the highest it's been since they started the uranium trade. Uh, we feel the same way. I, I speak for Graham and Marcelo, Fundamentals don't have an analog in a, in a market that already had really nice asymmetry. And I get it, it's frustrating. The market moves up or down, but you know, we can't worry about that. We just got to focus on the fundamentals. Yeah, Every, everything on the internet is always right. So, yeah, David, listen, yeah. we have two years of markets going straight up. And uh, so uh, I, I look at it as uh, price is a symmetry, right? So uh, the higher the price, the less symmetry you have. And, and on the other hand, the lower the price, the greater the asymmetry and obviously the, the return. 
So people should focus on the fundamentals and stop trying to guess what's going to happen with the market today or tomorrow. The, the market in the short run will go where it wants to go. But I think uh, it will go much higher in the long run. Uh, honestly, the, the risk relationship in the uranium market is one of the best I've ever seen. The fundamentals are very strong. They are stronger now than they were, they were like four years ago when we started uh, trading uranium. And I, I think it's just a matter of time. Marcel and, and Dave, I just want to go back to one question about Russian underfeeding because I don't that that's not a thing now that's going to enter the West. The tracking codes in uranium, I can't emphasize enough how this isn't like another commodity. This is serious shit, right? This stuff has to every kilogram is known where it is. Russian underfeeding is not being washed into is not once you know once the, the, those self-sanctioning and the sanctions and everything that's not going to be a thing. It just doesn't appear. So that gets tracked. So will the Russians underfeed? Well, they'll do it to get their own uranium for their own reactors and their own export markets. But but the random loose stuff that was floating around, if, if worried about coming in, that stuff is tracked like there is no tomorrow. If it's a kilogram made, they know where the kilogram went. You can't mess around with that stuff. This isn't oil or other gas, or it's not other stuff. Okay. Hey, sorry, and, sorry, just just quickly as well. <clears throat> I'll just say from my perspective, you know, my nuclear fund is part of, as you know, part of our global natural resources business. Um, so you know, I wear a few hats and we're across sort of everything. When I look at at uranium versus the rest of the resource sector, uh, you know, as Mike said earlier, you know, this is part of a of a of a more global macro sort of uh, sell down that's affecting everything. But when I look then at the commodity batting order, uh, which includes uranium, and, and look at <clears throat> how uh, the, my level of comfort, the uranium thesis can, you know, with the, the volatility down, the same as you know, the volatility up, I, I'm more comfortable that the uranium thesis can bounce back much more quickly than some of the other commodities we look at, where we're in the process of, of some proper short-term demand destruction and and uh, and macro uh, negative sentiment when when the dust settles here this can and you know it, it it does bounce back extraordinarily quickly so you know whilst we are obviously investors wearing some pain here the last sort of six weeks uh i'm with mike you know if you <laughs> there's you know there, there, there's some stocks obviously that we made in a, a decision that that you know they're probably less likely to uh uh, we like them less, so let's not own them uh, to try to uh, um, manage the downside a little bit more. But as I said, out of all the commodities I look at um, and, and all the all, uh, the opportunity into the next sort of six to 12 months, uranium is a, a standout by, by a country mile uh, on, on every metric. So, you know, it's just just need to be patient right here and wait for this uh, the noise to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to quieten. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the yeah, the noise, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, this Russian invasion of Ukraine has had a pretty large impact on the sector, you know, per, perhaps we should have all taken that section 232 review uh, a little more seriously a couple of years ago, you know, when the US government was warned that, uh, you know, there's a national security risk here so much of the deliveries were in the hands of the Russians and its allies. But, uh, you know, the, right now, certainly they it, it hasn't done much more than raise uranium prices, but do you think the the worst is yet to come? You, you said uranium's tracked, uh, but do you believe we'll see some disruptions here? You know, I know Cameco's having difficulty getting JV material out for, from Kazakhstan. Uh, Yellow Cake is, is taking deliveries without issue at this point. Yeah, you know, I just want to... Sorry. No, Marcel, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't want to hide the time. No, but uh, the, even Chemical has difficulties receiving hydrogen to, 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 to actually convert uh, the uranium. So uh, the, the, the problem is everywhere with, uh, with shipping and, and, and uh, you know, uh, transferring uranium from one side to the other. As Mike pointed out, most of the uranium is produced where it's not consumed and it needs to be transported to, to, to the final buyers. Um, I think we're going to see a uh, disruption, nothing serious, not, not to the point of shutting down the reactors, but I think uh, once price adjusts and people sign long-term contracts and give 
converters and reachers and, and uranium mining companies, uh, the ability to forecast for the future and go back to, to increase production or to start a mine. I think we are going to see this market uh, stabilize, but we are talking years from now, David. Uh, of course, it's going to be fluctuations on the way and we are prepared for that. And, you know, I would, I would go back to Guy's point and echo what he was talking about. It's, we see this again, this isn't, it's inelastic demand pretty much. We don't see, uranium isn't recession driven. It's not a contraction across commodities. It's not copper. That, that, that this stuff is needed, it's there, it's base load, it's planned years in advance. And you saw it in 2020 and you're going to see, we think you see it again. Um, the, so to the, to the question of how do you treat it, we, we, like I said, we keep some cash around because stuff happens and it gets caught up and swept up or somebody has a thesis they're running with. But um, there is risk in the fuel cycle and that risk is means higher prices. Risk meaning transportation risk. Risk meaning who wants to insure a ship? Not many. Um, but, 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 but there's that, that all that risk leads to higher prices because what it's doing is creating a heightened sense of awareness for energy security. The Russians are insuring, Mike. Yeah, exactly. We'll do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. this is, by the way, you know, it's funny. We talk about uranium and, uh, you know, uranium has kind of got intrigue around it, nuclear power and the Russians. And, you know, we, we, we've we been talking internally, like this is this is the uh, honeypot trifecta that's happening, right? A honeypot is where, you know, a, 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 uh, a, someone goes out and tries to seduce a target and compromise them. Well, well, what's happened? Here we are over the last, this, this, the, the communism falls, the, the wall falls. And all of a sudden we were talking about a bifurcated market now in one of the most serious energy sources in the world and really dangerous stuff if you don't transport and do it all properly. Um, they were, it, it became, uh, the West became seduced and all of a sudden it went from 1980, the US producing 40, uh, 40 of its 50 million pounds to, to now producing none and bringing it all in. And, and all of a sudden the power shifted to from east to from west to east, 40% enrichment, 30% conversion, 40% uranium mining with when you add all the east up. And you you look at all, so it was seduced into thinking that there are friends. And we saw that in 2016, 17, we started talking to fuel buyers. But we we have something out on the internet from 2017 talking about geopolitical risk in Russia. Fuel buyers would snap their suspender and look at us and they're like, we were idiots. And so that was the first one seduced into that. The second act of seduction in this market has been the carry trade. It, it seduced fuel buyers into thinking that there's always going to be the supply of uranium out there because there were low interest rates and there were and there were, was some surplus in the market. And then the third that seduces them is the, 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 the bevy of junior miners that run around saying that they could produce uranium at X price. They don't even, they, they have nothing yet. So, you know, and when you actually do the math and add that all up, that they're rounding errors um, to, 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 to where the supply demand deficit is. So it's just a very interesting time in the, in the fuel cycle. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting because uh, just uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, Mike's last point, uh, TradeStack estimates that we need 80% of the projects that are currently being uh, offered by the junior miners to come online to satisfy supply and demand. But experience tell us that uh, uh, less than one percent of this project has actually become a mine. So we're going to have problems uh, in, 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 in this uranium market uh, towards the, the well in the second half of this decade, for sure. I, I was Dave. I was talking to one of the industry forecasters in, uh, recently, and we were talking about what's the concept of a deficit, right? Does it mean reactors run out of fuel? No. It means there's less available mobile. It and and and. Our view is always that price solves that. At some point in time, you could keep going up there and somewhere you, there's some stuff that will come out, whether it's it's down blended for something, but that costs a ton of money and it's gonna require really, really high prices, but maybe some could get jog loose. So is it is uranium going to a thousand? No, we don't think so. We don't think it's going to 500 or 300, but can it move a lot higher? Yes. And the, the concept though was, well, if it's not running out of fuel, then, then how is there a shortage? To which I would say, if, well, there's here in the United States, gas was two and two and a half dollars a gallon six months ago, whatever it was, and now it's five dollars. Cars are still running, right? There's just a difference. There's on the margin, there's a different amount. Except here, there truly is on a supply demand standpoint, you're looking at massive structural deficits where they got to really reach deep. 
you know, one other thing I will point out, and, and I don't know if I've said this in our conversations before to you, Dave, is when you look the, and I talk about analog, I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record. If you look at the last cycle, the narrative is not supported by the mathematical facts. And the narrative was, oh, Cigar Lake went down and therefore prices went higher. Well, that the first flood was very minor in 06. And then in October of 06, it realized it wasn't gonna open in 07. But the price of uranium had gone from $7 in December 2000 to $41 before the first little flood, which was just temporary, a few months worth. By the time the second flood came, it was in the $60 range. Now, if I'm a fuel buyer and I'm sitting in a seat and I have to decide I need the long-term contract, oh my goodness, there's been a flood. Let me look at it. The quarter before, if I was looking at the industry forecaster supply demand model, and I looked out over a six-year period, a typical contract period, what does surplus versus or, or deficits in the market look like? You went from uh, 7 million pound surpluses up to 285 million pound surpluses. Yet the contracting went from 33% of consumption up to 150. There was 240 million pounds. So utilities went on a massive, massive buying spree when there was, by any accounts, uh, a surplus in the market. Also at that time, what you don't see discussed, but if it's not properly put in context, does a disservice to a study of the prior market is we often hear about what were inventories then versus now. And we often see a chart that says utility inventories, utility inventories, where they're, now they're a little bit higher. Well, commercial inventories are utility inventories plus broker, trader, financial. When you do that, now, now you're starting to get right there. But what never gets put in those charts is it the most guaranteed source of supply that we'll use the year 05 when contracting started was the pounds that were assured to come in under the HEU agreement, the megatons to megawatts program, where from 05 to 2013, there was 185 million pounds at, at 20 some odd million pounds a year that US fuel buyers knew was coming into that market under that program. They weren't sure if it would continue past 2013, but that's outside the realm of their contracting uh, uh, horizon. When you do that, you were looking at almost 300 million pounds between production, uh, between production, uh, I'm sorry, utility inventory between second uh, producer inventory and, and the megatons on a cumulative basis. It wasn't even close. So not only were they staring down the barrel of surpluses, but they had that guaranteed supply and they, and they contracted like there was no tomorrow. Fast forward to today, that does not exist. There's no guaranteed supply. The secondary sources of supply are imploding. Uh, shut Russia out of the market in, on the secondary side. The inventory drawdowns won't be there, and you're going to have to overfeed reactors. So it's really a very interesting time. And that's why when I started out, I was giving, giving a, a bust and chops a little bit about the spot market, because that's not where the action is, that, or that's not where the market is anymore. It's just moving past it. It's just psychologically, we don't see, you don't see if you're not living in the fuel cycle like the three of us here and like Segra does, you're, you're constantly talking to the fuel cycle. That's where you will see the long-term pricing is really starting to move. But more importantly, the terms are changing and, and the phone calls are coming in, not, not out to the producers. And, and so you're starting to see that change. Sorry to be so long. I think, I think, I think as well, if we're looking back at history, you know, we, we had a hundred dollar price of uranium with, uh, a, a, a big pipeline of, of projects coming to market back then. Uh, you know, we had Cameco expanding, we had Paladin with two mines, we had the Kazakhs expanding, and, and you know, you had a triple digit uranium price there at a time where there was not really a huge amount of reactor builds going on either. You know, you fast forward now and to all the things Mike said, you add to that and say, you know, we've got one of the biggest reactor build programs we've seen in decades. Um, we've got a, a primary mine supply deficit, regardless of whether those 50 odd reactors get completed or not. And we don't have any mega projects uh, in, in, in the wings, uh, well, one potentially. Um, you know, Cameco, all that low hanging fruit has been picked. Uh, anybody that says that, that they're anywhere, you know, that they're going to be able to achieve nameplate on their two assets um, is, is in dreamland. The, the Kazakhs are struggling 
the only expansion pounds coming out of the Kazakhs uh, in uh, um, their two well fields, the, the, the Russians are taking 100% of that for the first three years. And then after that, the Chinese are taking 51% Kazakh uh, joint venture. It's the first time the Chinese have, have been contracting in over a decade. And, and the restart projects that we've seen for care and maintenance, uh, you know, they, they, they raised some money to come into production. But, but again, so the, the question there is, even with all of that, there's still a primary mine supply deficit. You've got 50 odd reactors coming to the market the next five years, and you've potentially got one mega project in Canada uh, that's, 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 that, that, you know, we'll be lucky to be producing by the end of this decade where's everything else and that and that's the point again you know we had triple digits when there was a heap of things coming online and now here we are at sort of 47 dollars with even uh tighter fundamentals and more future demand uh and, and there's nothing in the wind so you know, what do you think the incentive the, price is do you, do you think it's 65 do you think it's maybe 70 with inflation i mean i i think the incentive price is is irrelevant um it has to be higher what that price is uh, i don't you know it's it, it, certainly a higher than 65 if that was a consensus two to three years ago because uh you know mining costs in every commodity have gone up the the real concern is is jurisdiction, is permitting, is environmental studies, is bureaucracy, is lawsuits, uh, you know, is uh, is all of those things that are going to be hindering new supply coming through. Um, where you know somebody says, "Oh, I've got all the right permits, and, and I can be in, in, you know coming to market in three years." Rubbish, because there's going to be a whole bunch of other things. You know, the price has got to seventy. I'm turning on. No. It's not as easy as that, and and it's not easy in any commodity to start a new mine at the, in the in the brave new world of ESG. Uh, add on the the stigma associated with uranium, it's even harder. So so again, saying we've we've reached a price, all this supply is going to come on. I I, I, I I shake my head and say no. You know, there's there's, yeah. there's a lot of hoops that need to be jumped. That's a great point, guy. Dave, last cycle, you know, you you did in the 60s somewhere like that, 50s, 60s. And you went to 137, and again, you had surpluses. And and don't take our word for it, right? Go back and read old models. Um, just you, one of the industry forecasters. Go subscribe to them, and lay out the math, and lay out. And I'm not saying go and lay out and say, okay, where do the cumulative next six years look like in 05? From 06, where do the cumulative next six years look like? It, you went up to a 285, 75 million pound surplus, right? So they're buying. From prices going from, uh, they started in 2007. By the time Cigar Lake flooded, it was 60, and then they took it to 137, and the incentive price was half of that. So that's what happens when you under contract, right? What 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 the thing this uh, in looking at this commodity for some reason I don't know why it is, what gets lost on people is the concept of destocking and restocking. When you're draining inventories down, you not only need to go and replace what you have, but then to your consumption levels, but now you got to restock the cupboards, and that's going to get tough. One of the things I should point out, and I, 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 I'll give credit to my, my friends Art and Adam over at Segra on this because uh, it's certain it's not in our models. We know it's out there, uh, but they've done some really great work on the SMR space, and um, you know they've they've spent a lot of time on it. And um, when when people think about SMRs, they think, oh well, they're much smaller. Let's say 100 megawatt SMR versus a one gigawatt, so it's 10x smaller. What what gets lost in that is it's it's highly it's high asset, uh, high say enriched uh, low enriched uranium. Uh, so it's 20% uranium, 19.9 19.95 versus let's say four four and a half percent now, and and also it has a 20 year life cycle, as as Art and Adam point out in their recent letter. They do a great job laying it out, and so what you see there is. It's a stunning amount of upfront fuel demand. And when you look at it, I'll just take Maria Korsak from the NEI, the Nuclear Energy Institute in the US. She just spoke and publicly said, we went out and, and, and polled our, our members, which are chief nuclear officers, the guys who make the decisions at the big utilities in, in, in the US. And they believe in 25 years, you'll have 90 gigawatts of SMRs. That's double the existing capacity today. That's a long time from now. But these first SMRs are going to be 27, 28, 29, that fuel cycle is tomorrow in, in uranium years. So that starts in 24 and 25. 
you could be talking at tens of millions, five, 10, 15, 20 million pounds of uranium. That's in nobody's, it's not in our models. We know it's there, but to, to guy talking about this, you know, uh, where's incentive price? I don't know, the market's gonna have to figure it out because the, the nuclear world order has changed, just like it's changed in other commodities. But what what Guy also said was this is a, a you know, people are reluctant to say it, but from 18 months ago, 24 months ago to today, there is a nuclear renaissance that's occurring. Whether people wanna hear that or not, that's the math, so. Well, with that, guys, we are already about uh, six minutes over on our time. So I, uh, with that said, I, I appreciate you joining to us today on our Fireside Chat. Thank you very much, Dave. I really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thanks, and, David. Next, uh, time, next time schedule like three hours so we can cover it all. Uh, we've got the questions. I, I can assure <laughs> you, we, we certainly didn't get to them all. And I apologize to the viewers if we didn't get to your questions. They certainly were... Uh, a lot of uh, topics we weren't able to broach but uh, you know special thanks to this group again and uh, thanks to everybody for joining uh, look for the replays they will be available on the financial on the red cloud financial services website so that's redcloudfs.com as soon as our media team can get them out get them ready so thank you everyone thank you dave see you guys talk to you soon thanks. bye bye, bye yeah. thank you cheers